There's a well-known saying that adversity doesn't create character so much as it reveals it. The fire of 1955 at Neustadt Fuel and Supply revealed a family value sustained for four generations of leadership, one that can only be seen in a crisis. In the early hours of March 10th, the Chicago Fire Department rushed to Neustadt Fuel and Supply on West Lake Street. Remember the phone ringing at home and dad picking it up and was devastated. We got in the car and we drove to Lake Street and they wouldn't let us go down because there was just a big ball of fire down there. So yeah, it destroyed most of all the equipment, oil trucks, service trucks. And I remember the fire captain, chief, whatever he was, telling my father that the construction of the building had saved the roof from collapsing. It was like, how are they ever gonna recover from this? The crisis revealed a deeply held family value. Be generous in all relationships. This had extended even to the family business's competitors. They were members of an oil association in Chicago, the Oil Man Association. So they'd go to monthly meetings with them. And the next meeting they went to, two competitors came and said they would help them with their deliveries for the winter. That was Harrigan Fuel and Bergman Oil Company. In 1907, the year Neustadt Coal, Hay and Grain was established, the Chicago economy was booming. John M. Neustadt saw an opportunity. Back then, bagging coal was a big thing because people had these little furnaces and little heaters. And a lot of, a lot of these buildings were three, four, five stories high and they needed bagged oil and they needed ice. So that's how you got into delivering to the homes. The founder, John Neustadt, lived with his wife, Mary, and their five children on Maypole Avenue. Directly behind the Neustadt shop on Lake Street on Chicago's west side. My memory of the place is that it was big and dark inside and green on the outside. We would go down in the basement and there was just all kinds of stuff in there that we just didn't even know what it was. It was kind of like the storehouse at the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Change came fast and furious to home heating. And after World War II, the new stats began to diversify the business. Most people at that point didn't want coal because it was dirty, it was inefficient, and it was expensive. So the oil business evolved from there, and Dad and his brothers bought three trucks to start and decided to stay in the business. Change also came to the leadership of the business. John, the eldest son of the founder, became the company's second leader in the 1940s. After returning from the war, Howard and Harvey joined Neustadt Fuel and Supply and over time took the company in a new direction, the controls business. In 1963, the company changed its name to Nuco. In addition to its fuel supply and heating installation, Nuco offered its first controls product line. So our first line that we had as NUCO was General Controls. So General Controls was located in Des Plaines, Illinois. And we were familiar with General Controls because we had used their products on the Timken boilers, or Timken burners that we had installed. So we had a familiarity with how they worked and that they were dependable. So when we started in 1963 and actually through the 70s, the inventory that we had at Nuco was not real extensive because it obviously entailed a lot of General Controls products, but it was very well thought out. As the new stats wrestled with upheavals in the home heating industry, the 1960s and 1970s brought a great social upheaval in the U.S. and in Chicago specifically. The neighborhoods started transitioning. And as it transitioned, there was an element that came into the neighborhood that was destructive. Martin Luther King was killed, Kennedy was killed, and there was just total upheaval on the west side of Chicago as there was everywhere else. They burned Madison all the way out to uh, Cicero Avenue. And we were two blocks from there to the north. For almost two decades, the business straddled two worlds. 
the old world of Newstat Fuel and Supply and the new world of Nuco. One served homeowners and continued operations until the mid-70s. The other served contractors and began to expand its product lines. Dad would seek out other lines, White Rogers. White Rogers was similar to General Controls, but probably had more of a residential emphasis. McDonald Miller was a product that was made in Chicago. And then there was Johnson Controls. That was another line we brought in. And they were all pretty much complementary to each other. Even amid social upheaval and transitioning to a new business model, the new stats always demonstrated generosity. So 1967 was the year of the big blizzard in Chicago. So it was a Friday afternoon. I was a senior in high school, and we got out early because the snow was so intense. We all got back to the neighborhood, and we just knew this was going to be a long deal. And we were just thrilled to death, you know, kids they were all playing, and, you know, there was two and a half feet of snow. And everybody thought, oh, this is going to be great. Well, Dad got home that night at 8 o'clock, and he said, uh, we need some help. These drivers cannot pull the hoses through this kind of snow. So we need two people on a truck. So he said, uh, call some of your friends and see if they want to work. My friends and myself, you get on the truck, you go to the bulk plant and load it with oil, and you go out and go to these locations and you gotta remember, it was two and a half to three feet of snow. And it was very windy and very cold. And all the snow was drifting different places. And I mean, it was taller than I was, you know. So it, every stop would take probably a half an hour longer than normal. It's said that values are caught more than they are taught. Howard modeled that nobody, not even the CEO, is above menial tasks. Howard even took on the job of sending mailers. So the mailers were something that you would have a catalog, a cover sheet, a business card, you put it in an envelope and you would get labels. Dad would do mailers throughout the country about Nuco. Every minute that he wasn't shipping or talking to customers, he would be typing up labels. And he typed them up on his Hermes typewriter, which we still have today. Throughout the 20th century, the new stats repeatedly risked the future of the business to grow the business. While there is a risk to starting a new business and going into something you've never really done with being a distributor, there's also a risk in staying put and not doing anything and just hoping that maybe things won't change. In 1983, the business shifted its model to be a master distributor. This risked offending their suppliers who were not just business partners, but friends. So when we decided to be a master distributor, it was kind of a pivotal moment because at that point, we were going to go head to head and be in competition with Marty Walsh from New York, who really invented the, the space. Uh, when I entered the business, Martin Walsh was the name of the business. He was a very dominant force. He was physically imposing uh, as a former boxer. And even though he's a little older by then, he looked like he could go a few rounds with you, if you know what I mean. So dad, after we talked to him, he thought about it and he said, okay, I hope you boys know what you're doing, but before we do it, I'm gonna call Marty and, and tell him so that he knows you know, that he's got a new competitor. We realized that we were just gonna do business the way we were gonna do business and we treated our customers the way we wanted to be treated. The move to master distributor became the impetus for exponential growth over the next 40 years. And as we went on, that became our signature to these other wholesalers around the country. Call Nuco, they have it. They don't have it, they'll get it. And we stocked a lot of that product and became known as the company that could have the product that they didn't have. Nuco's exponential growth is also linked to their early adoption of the internet to market and sell their products. The Newstat leadership's embrace of technology disrupted the distribution market, catapulting Nuco ahead of their competitors. In 1999, where we 
went online with our first website, we did realize that people were going to the website and we were getting traffic and we were getting eyes on what it is we do. So the next step in that was really trying to get data and content onto our site, knowing that, hey, we already have people there. We already have an audience. And if we can get better information, better data on there, that that's just going to allow people to come back more and more, and it's going to give them reasons to come back. In the early days of the online world, Nuco was on the rise. And while the business was in a growth spurt, the death of one of its key leaders and beloved family members left the close family business feeling lost in grief. Joe, son of second generation Newstad leader John, joined the family business after college, contributing largely to Nuco's sales by nurturing a relationship with its biggest vendor, Honeywell. And Joe was just a great person. He, he loved to talk to people, loved to be around people. People loved to talk to Joe. He was the kind of person that everybody went to when they felt they, they needed to talk to somebody. I said we called him our ombudsman because he was the guy that, he was our HR before we had HR. Vendors would relate to Joe better than anybody else because he had a way of talking to people. One morning in 1983, while running, he collapsed and was rushed to the emergency room. He was diagnosed with Marfan syndrome. Joe endured multiple surgeries and lived for another 20 years. When he passed, it was so unexpected, and it was just a hard, hard, hard thing for all of us to, to handle. Joe always beat the odds. He just always had. That's why we thought, well, why would he not beat him this time, you know? Despite the loss of Joe, Nuco experienced remarkable growth in the first two decades of the 21st century, prompting a significant relocation from Downers Grove to a new facility in Bolingbrook. We put a lot of time and energy and resources into coming up with a plan to move, and we executed it perfectly. And when I say that, I mean, we had every employee that was part of the move to help us get this accomplished, and it went off without a hitch. It was the epitome of teamwork, of, you know, just getting the task done at hand. The wind was behind us, and we were going in the right direction as, like, nothing can go wrong and we finally had space. We finally had plenty of areas for employee growth. We had what we thought was everything we needed for sustained growth. But a challenge that no one could foresee once again forced the Newstad leadership team to live out its values. So 2019, we came off of a record year in sales. We had wonderful growth. We were adding employees at a very, very healthy rate, and then 2020 hit. <laughs> and COVID came. It was the only time in my career that I have had to have conversations with my cousins in terms of what do we do now? And are we going to have enough sales to be able to meet payroll? When many large employers laid off workers, Nuco didn't release a single employee. The leadership defaulted to its century old value of prioritizing relationships. We had to really reanalyze how we were doing business, what the numbers were. What did we have to sell to keep the doors open? What did we have to sell to make payroll? While our fears were never realized to that extent, we were prepared to, if we had to kick money back in to make sure we made payroll, we were gonna do that. Those people were relying on us and we rely on them. What's next for Nuco? Changes in the economy and culture, the HVAC industry, and even in the family, all are certain. Change is inevitable. It's also certain, however, that Nuco and its leadership will meet each change with confidence, holding fast to the values that have sustained them for more than a century. Hard work, a restlessness with the status quo, and generosity in all relationships, especially its employee relationships. We're about 230 people today. It has gotten more difficult to know everybody but it's not impossible. I really work at learning names. I mean, learning names and using them. So I think by doing that, it makes the employees feel more at home that I'm not just a number, you know, somebody actually knows me and it makes me feel like, no, oh, I, I want to be here. This is some place I want to be. Paul is simply mirroring how the Newstat leaders who have gone before him care for people. Lived out values are what sustains a family business into the future, 
and for future generations.